afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 38th installment of the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Central Telehealth Center, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. Today, our topic will be all about the safety of the COVID-19 vaccines. Ligtas po ba ang mga COVID-19 vaccines? Yeah, deploy po ng ating gobyerno para maturukan ang ating mga kritik ng mga and uh, to, to join us today, we have really a spectacular uh, panel of experts to talk about the safety of the vaccines. Uh, for that, let me introduce my partner in crime and my mentor, the Special Envoy for Global Health Initiatives and the Director for Systems over, the, uh, over at Honolulu, Hawaii, Dr. Susie peneda Morka. Dr. Susie? Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, Raymond, kamusta kayo? Kamusta po lang mga nasa audience natin? Natutuwa ako. I was trying to learn the different ways you say. <laughs> you say good morning or good afternoon, no? So we'd like to welcome you. We do have uh, very, very interesting speakers today. Um, usually, we have clinicians talking about clinical management. But today, from beginning to end, you will have clinicians who are also experts in public health. So we are going to talk about vaccines and um, we're going to talk about vaccine safety, which I think you are all very keen to learn more, learn more about that. Um, Raymond, you know, uh, we thought that we'd like to get some idea about the audience and you must have been seeing surveys about what people think about vaccines, but we're going to do a survey with you, with the audience. So, um, Raymond, uh, you want to introduce our little survey so we get a picture of um, who's out there. Who's out there with us right now? Go ahead, Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susie. So, for those who are our attendees now numbering at uh, nearly, oh, look, pas na pala, 1,600 plus attendees po for this webinar, not uh, counting for our speakers. This may or may not be the first poll question or series of poll questions for today, uh, but we hope you'll be able to join us for this uh, survey. So the first question would be, what place are you viewing the webinar from? So we understand that a lot of you have already inputted in the chat box your whereabouts, pero sana po kung mailagay nyo rin po ito sa ating survey na nasa harap po natin ngayon, uh, mas mainam po ito para mas malaman po natin kung saan po ang ating distribution. Uh, we, we understand that there are those who have registered outside of the Philippines uh, to be able to get them in the program as uh, soon as possible. The second question would be, what is your line of work? So meron po tayong mga from medicine, from nursing, from pharmacy. So please continue to input your, um, your answers po in terms of line of work. For those who are asking, we have nearly 4,800 registrations for this webinar alone. So that goes to show how important the safety of COVID-19 vaccines is to all of our audiences in Stop COVID-19 webinar series. The third question here, kayo po ba ay papayag? Would you consent to the vaccination kung ito po ay libre? So okay, marami na po ang nag input So we'll try to wait for a finalization of that count. The fourth question, magbabayad po ba kayo para sa inyong bakuna? Would you pay for your own vaccination? Okay. The fifth question, what would convince you that COVID-19 vaccine is safe? Multiple choice po ito. So uh, ano po ang magkukumbinsi sa inyo na ligtas ang COVID-19 vaccine? is uh, someone I know has received it. Second question, second option is my doctors. Uh, the third option, the LGU provides it for free. So it, it's more of a financial burden more than anything. The DOH provides it for free. And then finally, inibitahan po ako ng mga kaibigan ko para magpabakuna kasama sila. So yun po ang last option for question number five. And then finally, we have the sixth question. If you were to refuse an offer for a free COVID-19 vaccine, ito po ay maaring sa kadahilan ng ano. So marami po dito nakalagay ng mga options. So for those who are inputting, we are we now have more than a thousand 
uh, attendees po no who are keying in their answers and we hope to be able to get a final number for each of those answers later on. Okay, over to you, Dr. Susie. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for participating in that poll. Um, and it looks like we are having a good picture. Later, we'll we'll talk about the results. But we just wanted to get a sense of what you're thinking, and uh, I think that will help also our speakers try to address some of your some of your concerns and and your issues. So. Um, Raymond, I think before we go into our um, opening remarks, you might want to talk about the certificates first. And to thank okay. everyone. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Suze. For those who are joining us for the very first time uh, in Stop COVID, that's webinar series. Uh, we are now, may I call on TVUP to flash on in uh, our certificate, ang itsura po ng ating certificate na dinidistribute for those who are eligible to receive it. And by eligibility, this will be those who have spent at least 50% of the webinar duration dito po sa Zoom. Ito po ang more or less itsura na matatanggap po ninyong certificate along with the presentations of the speakers and of that particular webinar. So we understand na meron po mga nagsasabi po sa amin na pakapilitan po itong pangalan ko. Uh, pwede po bang paki-check kung ako po ay makakatanggap ng certificate. So just an update for everyone, we have already distributed all the certificates that for eligible recipients po no for all previous 37 webinars that we have held. So if you feel that uh, you, you you need or sorry if if you feel that you are qualified to receive an electronic certificate uh, by virtue of your attendance in that in that webinar please uh, let us know through our email we stop covid at up.edu.ph uh, we also would want to make sure that you are keying in your correct how it's correctly spelled in your name in the registration link para lang po alam po natin na yun po kasi ang maka-reflect doon po sa ating electronic certificate. Okay, but before I turn the floor over again to Dr. Susie for an intro of our opening remarks speaker, I'd like to thank uh, very, very much the hardworking team behind the Stop COVID as webinar series uh, at the University of Philippine System, uh, at, the, at UP Manila, at Office of the Chancellor, at National Institutes of Health and National Telehealth Center. We also have uh, very much uh, appreciated support and guidance from our colleagues at the Philippine General Hospital and the College of Medicine. For those who are viewing this uh, in the Zoom, uh, maraming salamat po. At uh, ito po ay very, very successful because of the support that we are getting from the UP Information Technology Development Center or ITDC. And then finally, for those who are watching this in YouTube, maybe that's easier for them or mas gamay po nila sa YouTube. This will not be possible, actually this whole production will not be possible without our very hardworking team at TVUP, which is the Internet Television Network of the University of the Philippines. So uh, for those who want to watch this in the playback, just go to the YouTube channel po of TVUP. We are also being live streamed in our Facebook channel at Stop COVID Deaths. Over to you, Dr. Susie. Hey, thanks, Raymond. And apart from all of the people who are involved in production, without you, our audience, we wouldn't be able to do this. So uh, I'd like to just mention some of those who are uh, have put uh, their location on the chat box. So Kabanatuan City, Cebu, um, Bulacan, Baguio, uh, Palo, Leyte, the UP campus in Leyte. Uy, wala daw tayo Central Visayas Choice. Okay, we're going to fix that. We're going to have that next time. Jose uh, Reyes Memorial Medical Center, uh, okay, Sambales, Bulacan, Togegarao, Cagayan, Cebu, Abu Dhabi, oh my goodness, okay, Lipa Medical Center, Philippine Red Cross, Dumaguete City. So indeed, we are seeing participants from all over the country and uh, we just want to thank you for, for making it possible because without this audience, we would not be able also to, to understand what the issues are. And, you know, I encourage you to use the Q&A box. So if you have questions, you can put them in there uh, so that we'll try to, we'll ask our speakers to start answering them when they're not 
when they're not speaking. All right, so without further ado, let's go to our opening speaker. Uh, you know him. He is, uh, as I said, all of our speakers are clinicians. They have been practicing medicine, but they also cross over into public health. So Ted Rebosa is a very well-known surgeon, but he is also executive vice president of uh, the University of the Philippines. And he is special advisor of the National Task Force on COVID-19. So he's in the know on what's going on. And um, we'd like to welcome Ted to your home webinar. So welcome, Ted. Thank you, Susie. And uh, in, in behalf of the good afternoon to all the participants, the speakers, all the way from Abu Dhabi and uh, as far north, I saw as uh, La Union and Tugigarao and as far south as General Santos and uh, Sambuanga City. Uh, I think as of now, we have over 2,000 participants on the Zoom webinar, plus many more on the YouTube. So in behalf of the President of the University of the Philippines, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, TVUP, uh, our ITDC, UP Manila, our National Telehealth Center, I would like to welcome all of you to the 38th episode, 38th episode of Stop, Death, Stop COVID Deaths webinar series to discuss the hottest, really the hottest blockbuster topic of COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. And based on the communications with me last night, uh, the, one of our speakers, Dr. Anna Onlim, was saying that her friends cannot register. There was a registration block that was happening last night. I believe this is, again, the reason why this is going to be a hit webinar episode. And if you heard, it's, this is our 38th webinar, and it started last year, actually, during the time of the emergency uh, enhanced community quarantine period. Dr. Susie Mercado requested me to hold the webinar in that week. On a, I think she asked me on a Thursday, on a Tuesday, and wanted the webinar by Friday. So, uh, and she, she said she heard about the respiratory therapy being used by the PGH doctors to save the lives of our fellow physicians who were dying of COVID pneumonia at that time. And they had a very successful therapy. You all know that now, the high flow nasal cannula procedure. And of course, as uh, the executive vice president of UP, I abused my authority and basically mandated UP units that were used to webinars uh, to work together. And this was the National Telehealth Center led by Raymond Sarmiento, uh, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs led by Vice President Nanny Perna, together with her colleague, Assistant Vice President Rika Abad. And lastly, we utilized the experience of TVUP under Professor Gigi Alfonso. Dr. Susie helped us with the uh, field help to make sure that the whole country would hear about that webinar. And we had a blockbuster webinar uh, because of the thirst for knowledge for things about COVID-19 and how to treat it. After that success, our team uh, committed to deliver more webinars. And I congratulate the team today because this is now our 38th. Imagine, in a year we've produced 38 webinars and several of them were blockbuster or uh, box office hits. For today, our Stop COVID Death team has tried to address the most pressing issue, and that is the issue of vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, I have suddenly seen many talk about vaccines and seem to be pseudo-experts on vaccine after what they've read on social media. And I've also seen many misinformation being shared innocently or intentionally. And our goal today is to answer the question, what we don't know. Uh, but I guess there is a dictum that uh, comes in these types of cases that we use in emergency medicine. We really don't know what we don't know. So that's uh, part of, I think, what we need to discuss. The characteristic of Stop COVID-19 Deaths webinar is really the fact that we invite the real experts, people who know their topic and understand what they're doing. Today, our expert indeed is a real one. Our experts are real ones to talk on the topic that he will share to us on how to understand clinical evidence or research evidence. And that is Professor Antonio Danz, who is, happens to be my classmate in medical school. I used to compete with him in, in, uh, in high school, in the track team, in the hurdles events. <laughs> he was in another school run by Jesuits, and I was in a school run by Benedictines. <laughs> he's a, he's also, he was also my internist and cardiologist yeah, yeah, for mo most of my surgical patients, and I trust him. I trust him with my patients and to, uh, to analyze and tell me the risk of surgery for most of my patients. 
he was our class president. And of course, I was the class clown. I do the stand-up comics during lunch breaks and relieved everybody's stress so that they could all graduate from med school. I also like to thank Dr. Anna Ong Lim, who like me have been helping the IATF throughout the crisis since the beginning of this pandemic. Also, ASEC Eric Tayag of the Department of Health, who I worked for five years when I was Under Secretary of Health. And uh, we, have, we together have responded to several epidemics. And uh, he has also taught me several dance steps as well. So again, to our constant uh, participants in, the, in this series, uh, do we hope you, you will be enriched by the program today? And of course, to the new ones in the webinar series, our past episodes are still available po. They are free online. You just type in the uh, search bar of YouTube, TVUP Stop COVID-19 Deaths, and you will see all 37 of them. With that, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, let's all listen and learn. Welcome and good afternoon. Good morning to the ones in Abu Dhabi. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Ted, for an thank energizing you. introduction, which is what we need. Uh, we're going to talk about something uh, Safety, you know, so I think this is all that this is something that uh, concerns us on a very personal level. And uh, I think um, we, we, really, we, we really want to hear the latest, most reliable uh, information. And uh, as Ted has described our speakers, I am very sure you are going to get the best information available today. So Raymond, um, we have another poll. <laughs> so today, po, we thought we were gonna have a number of interactive uh, activities for you so that you'll be up on your feet and answering and thinking with us and uh, naman kami, no? you're very engaged. So Raymond, let's go to our opinion poll. Thank you, uh, Dr. Susan. Thank you, EVP Ted, for that uh, lively and inspiring message po, no? And I'd like to preface this uh, poll by saying that this may or may not be the last survey question or poll po for today. So I hope uh, you will sustain your ano po, enthusiasm in answering the questions uh, right in front of you. Um, number one question, it reads, how do we know if a COVID-19 vaccine is safe? We have four options, namely clinical trials were done properly and published in scientific journals. Option two, it meets FDA standards for safety and efficacy. Option three, side effects are generally minimal. And option four, all of the above. Okay po. Uh, uh, the second question po, it reads, we have four questions po. No? The second question reads, how can decision makers ensure safety of the COVID-19 vaccine? So the first question, the first option states, scientists and experts are allowed to do their job without political interference. Uh, Option B, all administrative steps for approval of COVID-19 vaccines are properly followed. Option C, under the emergency use authorization, all partners follow government guidelines for use. And option D is all of the above. Before we... Last two questions, I'd like to just give a shout out po to our registrants and for those who are joining us either locally or internationally. Uh, we have those... Uh, who are joining us all the way from Dr. Paulino J. Garcia Memorial Research and Medical Center from Talugtog, Medo Ecija, Laurel Memorial District Hospital in Tanawan, Batangas, the Dr. Pablo Otore Memorial Hospital in Bacolod City, the RHU Siayan in Sambuangal del Norte, and RHU Bumbaran, Amay Manabilang in Lanao del in, in Barm. So those are just a few of those uh, who have signed up. We continue to see people uh, inputting where they are from and giving a shout out from where they are currently viewing this webinar in the chat box. Po, no? So please continue to do that. Internationally, we have those who have signed up all the way from Pandemia Sinica from Taipei, Taiwan, the National University Health System in Singapore, and Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital in Singapore. We also have the World Health Organization country office in Indonesia. Uh, tuning in, the Filipino community in Indonesia in Jakarta, Maria Regina School, Semarang, Indonesia, the Quasia Diagnostic Services in Bandarseri, Begawan, and the Prestige Hospital in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, in the Middle East, we have representatives from the Almasara Hospital Ministry of Health in Muscat, Oman, 
the Institute of Research and Medical Consultations in Damam, Saudi Arabia, uh, Imam Abdul Rahman bin Faisal University and Al Kobar, Saudi Arabia, also and Al Jubail, Al Karj. We also have Cambridge Medical and here we have Rehab Center in Abu Dhabi, the Ministry of Health of Kuwait. Wow, the Adam University, the very first, uh, Adam University, Kyrgyzstan. I think the, that's the very first time I'm saying someone is from Kyrgyzstan, and then we also have ones from Tripoli, Libya, from Long Island, New York, Jacksonville, North Carolina, Keyport, New Jersey, Bridgewater, New Jersey, New York, Ontario, Canada. Oh, sorry, North York, Ontario, Canada, Niagara Falls, uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and East Melbourne, Australia. So, po kadami tayo, but we are just uh, a little over 50% no, of those who have signed up for our webinar for today. We are now numbering a little over 2,400 attendees uh, for this webinar. The third question, po, and uh, just to complete this, is this statement true? A drug cannot be safe if it is not efficacious. And then finally, the very important question that we want to answer at the end of this webinar, ligtas po ba ang COVID-19 vaccines? Are COVID-19 vaccines safe? So, uh, thank you po for those who have keyed in their answers. Maraming salamat po. And we will try to uh, circle back to these questions later on in the webinar. Dr. Susi? Thank you very much, Raymond. And uh, again, just like to, uh, to welcome those who are just coming in right now. Because we have people, when we started, uh, we had a big number of people, but we still have people who are here. So welcome to everyone. And um, we are now going to the introduction of our first presenter. And as I mentioned earlier, our speakers today are clinicians who have crossed over into public health and have done so very successfully. And um, our next speaker, Dr. Tony Dance, you've seen him testify on tobacco control. He's been in uh, all these hearings on safety. And currently, his new role is he's the spokesperson of the Healthcare Professions Alliance Against COVID-19. But um, I agree with Ted, uh, you know, if there's a cardiologist I'll trust, it's going to be Tony Dance. And he is professor at the UP College of, of Medicine. Um, and I would say a good friend, uh, somebody who just wants to use science properly to save lives. No? And um, that that um, pure intention is obvious whenever Tony Dance speaks. Kumbaga, walang agenda si Tony Dance. Gusto lang niya, scientific tayo. And I think that's going to be an underlying theme for his talk. So, Tony, how are you doing before you give your presentation? Kamusta na? Hi, Susie. Staying safe. Thank you for inviting me here. Okay, so we're very happy to have you, Tony, and please go ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank, thanks, Susie, and uh, um, greetings to everyone, our uh, VP, Ted Herbosa, my classmate, uh, and uh, Chancellor Padilla is here, uh, Menchit, good uh, afternoon, and our Dean, uh, Charlotte Cho, and uh, the other ordinary citizens like me. <laughs> so good morning. Oh, and a special call out to our uh, no, to our MC, Dr. Raymond Sarmiento, who was recently awarded uh, no, 10 outstanding young Filipinos. Nainggit ako sa'yo, Raymond, kasi nainggit ako dun sa young, kasi hindi na ako papasasayang ngayon. So uh, let's start with a Paul, if I can share my, uh, with the, uh, yeah, with well, some declarations. Uh, just a minute. Is, is my slide showing, you know? You see? No. It's not? It's not yet moving, sir. We just see your parang intro poster. Yes, yes, that's the one. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize because uh, that I speak on behalf the, of the Healthcare Professionals Alliance Against COVID-19, an amalgamation of more than 150 professional organizations, not just doctors, but nurses, midwives, pharmacists, med techs, uh, dentists, and others uh, who have joined hand uh, to, to help 
in the government to help the people in uh, uh, surviving this pandemic and managing this pandemic. So the uh, slides I present have been vetted by HPAC uh, in previous meetings. Um, I'm going to start with a quick poll. So uh, I'm hoping people can log on in your phone or in your laptop to menti.com and use the code that's shown, 8159627. Uh, or you can scan the QR code to, to get to that page. I'm going to give you data and ask you what your, which vaccine you prefer. No? Uh, the situation is this. Let's imagine you are a policymaker. You could be uh, in the, uh, a mayor or a governor. Or you could be the president of a private corporation or, or the secretary of health, depending on who you want to represent. No? Uh, and you were given data on the vaccine. Uh, two vaccines, let's say, no? Uh, which one would you prefer if I told you that vaccine A uh, is 95% effective against COVID-19 and vaccine B is only 75% effective? Uh, but one is slightly cheaper. The less effective one is cheaper and the more effective one is uh, more effective. The, more so, effective. yeah, more expensive one is uh, more effective effective which one would you prefer to procure as that policy maker yeah. uh, so after you answer this question just stay on menti.com because i'm going going to be asking the same uh, question uh, as the lecture goes on so now we show here most people will prefer the slightly more uh, effective uh, but the uh, slightly more uh, expensive but the more effective vaccine okay understandable some are hesitant now i'm going to uh, add the data i give to you now what if because of maybe storage and transport uh technical requirements uh we find that vaccine a is only accessible and can only reach 20% of Filipinos. While vaccine B, uh, probably, you know, easier to manage transport and store, less logistics necessary, uh, can, can be accessed by 90% uh, of Filipinos. I'm going to uh, clear this. So right now, an overwhelming, just stay on that, no? On that web page. Uh, I'm now ask the question again. And you can answer. Parang nagrally yung vaccine B, you know? uh, If you look, uh, ano naman? Eh? If it's ninety percent, if it's seventy-five percent effective on ninety-three on ninety percent of Filipinos, mga sixty-three percent ang nabe-benefit mo. Ito, if it's 95% effective and only 20% Filipinos, 18% lang ang nabibenefit na. So now we see a rise in B. And then the third question is this. If you had long-term side effects, and nakita mo is the topic for today, two in a thousand sa vaccine B, no? uh, and then one, uh, two in 10,000, and one in 10,000, yung serious long-term side effects, and yung effectiveness against the UK variant, so mas maraming side effects sa B, pero mas effective siya against the UK variant. And the duration of protection, but the duration of protection is shorter uh, compared to vaccine A. Then, uh, which one would you use? Now, I'm going to reset it first. Huwag muna kayo sumagot para... Uh, Reset results. And now you can answer. Which one would you prefer now? Parang naging neck to neck na yung A and B, you know? Okay, I'll go back to this later. You can continue answering. What's my point? My first point is, well, we hardly 
know the answers to many of these questions. As of now, we only know efficacy for three months uh, because that's the published results. We don't know long-term efficacy and when we will need uh, a second or a third booster. And we only know efficacy and cost. We don't know uh, what the logistic problems will be fully. We don't know the long-term side effects because follow-up is very short. We don't know effectiveness against UK variant. We'll find out in a few weeks or months. And most of all, we don't know the duration of protection. No? What if we put all our money on one vaccine only to find out that we need a booster in four months? No? Siguro rich countries can afford that no? uh, to cough out another 80 billion. Uh, but maybe we need to be more uh, careful uh, when we uh, try to make that decision. So my message in this first slide is it's a complicated decision. It's not easy. And uh, giving you this hypothetical data, uh, if you look, ano tayo, hindi ba? Almost evenly split between the two, uh, depending on what data is provided. So added to that difficulty or complexity is confusion. Everyone wants to procure, everyone wants to distribute. People have opinions on uh, what is effective and safe. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric going around. Uh, pero sino ba talaga? So who authorizes? Who chooses? Who distributes? Because if we get, if we bury the complexity in this confusion, then we ruin vaccine trust uh, and the whole thing uh, falls apart. So I'm going to spend most of my talk on, on that process for approving it. Before I start, I want to declare my conflicts of interest. And the next time you hear anyone talk about vaccines, you should ask for their conflict of interest. No? I've been involved as a national leader of clinical trials and performed systemic reviews on, on many drugs. Uh, I think I did one vaccine, the flu vaccine, to prevent uh, complications in heart failure patients. The funders of the studies I conduct have been UP Manila, PCHRD, Canadian Health Research Institute, Wellcome and Newton Fund. Uh, also, some companies like AstraZeneca and Pfizer are here. My studies were on cardiovascular drugs and they were years ago. But still, you know, I need to declare that uh, and make it clear uh, so that people uh, understand where I'm coming from. I have always insisted on independent analysis and freedom to speak and have never used slide sets issued by the pharmaceutical company. And I have no financial stakes on any of the COVID-19 vaccines. I'm an advocate of evidence-based medicine, as my students know, and have at some time lectured or lobbied against the overuse of several technologies, including uh, vaccines in the past and uh, rapid antibody tests for COVID uh, and other technologies. So with that said, ano ba talaga yung process? How do we find out? if the drug is safe and effective. Now, all of us, or most of us here, I, mostly doctors, nurses, midwives, healthcare professionals, uh, and even the media and uh, lay people know this. When you do trials on humans, there are several phases. Phase one is you do it on a handful of uh, uh, volunteers. Um, where's my pointer? You can see my pointer, right? Okay. Oh. And then phase two, you do small trials, you know, you know, a vaccinated group against a placebo group, perhaps, to see if it's hopeful and, and if you'd like to go on to a phase three or a large trial. And uh, that's what we're seeing now, phase three, large trials, randomizing sometimes tens of thousands of patients. Uh, based on phase three trials, the Food and Drug Administration uh, issues a certificate of product registration which allows them now to enter the Philippine market and sell it. And this is a power provided to FDA by the FDA law or RA 9711, which I think is uh, 2009 or something. Once in the market, uh, we still need to follow up these people who are given the drug. 
based on phase three trials. So we conduct phase four or post-marketing surveillance on people who receive the drug. No? And uh, what happens after phase four? The Health Technology Assessment Council, based on the universal health care law, gives a positive recommendation on which of these drugs, in this case vaccines, uh, may be considered. No? Now, this is the wording, positive recommendation, but it's actually a powerful function because uh, a positive recommendation from HTAC is required for PhilHealth or DOH to procure any of these medications or vaccines. So that's the normal process. Uh, parang HTAC gives you a menu of the vaccines that you can procure. Based on that, the central government uh, through the DOH or uh, um, will now procure the drugs. The national government to, will procure the drugs, uh, plan the storage and distribution, so uh, and transport of these vaccines. Uh, in the case of vaccines, it's the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group who plans uh, the distribution and prioritization. No? Tapos na ba? Hindi pa. <laughs> Di distribute mo pa doon or you will uh, actually yeah provide it to the people and who does that it's going to be the local government units no so dito pla parang planning pa lang ito actual distribution na by the local government units at the end of the day when you're talking of vaccines they are the final deliverers tapos na ba hindi pa rin those who are given the drug as dictated by uh, the you know phase four post-marketing surveillance requirements need to be monitored and in the case of vaccines this is monitored through the national adverse events following immunization committee or the NAFI. yan na ba lahat ng ano agencies meron pang isa yung vaccine expert panel which is concerned with research development here and development here on the left column okay now merong isang panggulo sa covid because it is such a dire emergency and thousands are dying, we have uh, interim or preliminary phase three results coming out. Hindi pa yung final phase three. And we need to take a look at it because we need something against this pandemic. And how does the FDA approve that? They are required to approve based on completed trials. Well, they were given the authority by Executive Order 121 to issue an emergency use authorization or EUA you know, based on preliminary phase three data. So does that solve it? Uh, medyo may problem pa. Uh, how does HTAP uh, make a recommendation? You know? Kasi they're required to make phase four and how can the procurement process go on if FDA issues an EUA it did not exempt UHC law did required phase four. So nagkaroon ng ano yung Bayanihan Act, as you know, last year, authorizing HTA or the Health Technology Assessment Council to issue their recommendations based on uh, phase three trials without phase four. Okay na ba? Hindi pa rin. Kasi they need the completed phase three trials we need to authorize, they need to be authorized uh, to base their uh, preliminary recommendations on the preliminary phase three trials. Ito wala pa. I think there's an administrative order uh, for this, but we need an executive order or a republic act, uh, and we are working on getting this done as soon as possible. So HTAC is not sleeping while this is. Uh, we're waiting for this. They are working day and night. Uh, to get the evaluations done. Now, uh, ano ba yung mandates ng agencies na to? The Food and Drug Administration, their main mandate is to assess safety and efficacy, meaning uubra kaya ito. No? Uh, is there, uh, they will be reviewing the trials submitted, which is uh, hundreds of thousands of pages if you consider all the vaccines available there. Ang mandate ng Health Technology Assessment Council, effectiveness. Will it work? No? Itong efficacy, can it work? Itong effectiveness, will it work in the real world? And that's a difficult decision I'll show you later. 
They also want to look at efficiency. Sulit ba ang gagastusin natin dito? At kaya ba natin no? uh, with minimal resources? And of course, they are mandated also by the UHC law to address conflicts of interest. Uh, sila lang yung meron talagang sunshine provision na kung meron diyang may conflicts of interest, manage it. No? Uh, kung kunwari may declarations, katulad ko, kung ako nasa HTAC, I should not be allowed to vote uh, because of my, hindi rin na nga ako talagang involved sa vaccine trials. I'm I did trials for Pfizer and AstraZeneca years ago. Uh, but I would decline from, and they were not on vaccines. Uh, so I would decline from voting because of the potential conflict of interest. We need to protect that process. Ang DOH and NITAG, uh, their main issue will be equity. Patas ba? Makatarungan ba ang pagdistribute ng ating vaccine? No? Ayaw natin tong maging labanan ng capacity to pay na we are going to vaccinate those who can afford saka na yung mga hindi hindi makabayad no this has to be equitable unahin yung nangangailangan uh, ng mga tao so uh, there are also advisory groups like expert groups yung mga society uh, professional societies, in civil society groups, no, and private corporations have their own evaluations, and uh, a very ample support for the usual agencies, yung IATF vaccine cluster, uh, who provide. They have a technical group on vaccine evaluation and selection, diplomatic engagement, kasi kausap mo rito mga pangulo, eh, no? procurement and financing, maintenance of the cold chain. Uh, demand generation, communications with the public, and and the program itself uh, as to, as it will be implemented. No? Uh, we need to be clear about these processes. On the left here, research and development. Yan. On uh, second column, we have the core agencies uh, and their mandates in red. The core processes they use to get the vaccine approved and available to those in need. And we have the support groups. No? This has to be so clear. No? Na procurement is central government. That, uh, and they have guidelines of distribution which shall be implemented by the LGUs. No? Uh, so, ang tanong ba, pwede ba tayong pumili? Pwede tayong pumili. At ito ang process ng batas para tayo makapili ng tamang vaccine para sa lahat. No? So who do we listen to for final approval? It's the FDA for final recommendations, the HTAC, and for final distribution according to an equitable plan. We look at central government under the leadership of the IATF and the Department of Health. Now, yung, just to show you how complicated it is, ito yung health technology assessment framework ng ano, HTAC, which I borrowed last night, thanks to Dr. Meme Guerrero and Yen. Um, Marfori and Dr. Marita Reyes. No? Ito yung gagawin nila. They will assess the magnitude of the pandemic, safety and efficacy of the drugs, the social impact. No? Uh, tatanggapin ba ng mga tao yan? And then ito, yung cost and efficiency. And then, will it be fair? And what's the impact on at the front lines? And ang daming data po niyan. To assess magnitude and severity, they have to look at the deaths and morbidities, the expenses from the vaccine, the diseases we've neglected, and the impact on the economy. For safety and efficacy, they review the trial data, but they don't, they go beyond that. They need to project the impact in the real world on the number of cases, deaths, confinements, quarantines, and the impact on special groups and adverse events. So, so kahapon yata meron ng ano eh, special advice on pregnant women from WHO no uh, and this change almost daily uh, they do focus group discussions uh, with key uh, leaders and the uh, public ano bang expectation nyo on safety efficacy susi pwede nyo padala yung eh, ano results ng survey niyo <laughs> sa HTAC 
uh, transparency very important to the public and equity fairness no wag tayong magunahan unahin natin yung mga nangangailangan and then indemnification ibig sabihin kung merong side effect how are you compensated and then affordability and viability hindi lang unit cost ng vaccine po <laughs> kasama po dyan ang logistics may gastos yan training of people monitoring yung information technology para ma-enter natin sa database, impact on the budget, handling and distribution. Ito vulnerable groups by gender, by religion, by residence. And sa household, ano ba ang impact nito on averted costs like testing, treatment, isolation, income loss, and transport costs. Ang alam lang natin, trial data and unit cost, that is not enough. This is a very complicated task and you need a master's degree to do it. Kung kaya niyong gawin yan, bihira ang may kayang gumawa niyan. Pero kung kaya niyong gawin yan, pakisubmit ng pangalan niyo, dapat member kayo ng HTAC. Kasi kukonti lang ang taong makakapag-integrate ng lahat ng information na to. And they have to do it continuously kasi the data is moving. No? So ano ba ang... Uh, while we wait, uh, alamin na nila, gaano katagal ba ang protection? Is it effective against new variants? What are the rare side effects? How do they compare to each other? And what's the effect on elderly, pregnant, lactating women and children? And will it end the pandemic? Yan, all eyes on the US and UK. So to conclude, people must have access as soon as possible. Okay yan, as soon as possible. Kaya lang dapat... We made to make sure it's safe and effective and distributed equally regardless of race, religion, or ability to pay. We must protect the core processes and mandates of the vaccination program. No? And distribution must be equitable and not become a battle of purchasing power, which we sometimes see. You know, rich corporations can buy it, poor corporations cannot. Rich communities can pre-purchase, the poor cannot. Preventive measures must continue. So my last slide, you know, are the COVID-19 vaccines safe? Sa akin, we need to nuance that question. Is it safe enough compared to the cost, compared to the benefit? So we balance that. You know? And we need to note that there will be no permanent answer uh, as of January 29, 2021. And tomorrow we may have a different answer from today. And my answer, is it safe enough? It depends. If the agencies are untainted, untainted, their processes are maintained and followed, and their mandates are protected from political, commercial, and self-interest. Sinama ko dyan yung self-interest. Huwag ho tayo mag-unahan. No? Kung bata pa tayo, malakas pa tayo, kahit kaya nating bumili, paunahin natin yung mga kailangan talaga at yung mahihirap. No? And if we do this, and then this is my answer, Susie. It depends. Because that's my whole point. We need to wait for what FDA says and what HTAC says. And we need to uh, help them come up with a credible, credible answer by being vigilant. Tayo yung mga tao. Pera natin ang ginagamit. We need to make sure all of this happens. And we need to maintain solidarity uh, and make sure that self-interest, including our own, uh, will not be a determinant of who gets the vaccine first. Yan po ang promise ng Healthcare Professional Alliance against COVID-19. We will be vigilant. We will speak up when, it, when we need to speak up, and we have done it in the past. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Dr. Tony Dance. Uh, very clear as always, Tony. And... Um, really giving us multiple perspectives. No? Kasi maingay eh, no? It's a very noisy environment. And, and we really hope that this webinar series is a space for all of you, our audience, to just calm down, <laughs> listen, so that we are not contributing to the noise unnecessarily. And I think Tony has made some very clear points that we're going to go back to later on. So thank you very much. It's Dr. Antonio Dance. All right, next speaker, another um, 
very well-known, very credible person. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Eric Taya, who is Director 4 of DOH KMITS, Knowledge Management Information Technology. But I don't know, Eric, if you'll allow me to say this, but I met Eric many, many, many years ago. Eric, it's okay. Tell the story about our meeting. <laughs> Eric, Eric was starting in the he's taking a deep breath. He was starting in the Department of Health. And I, I can't remember if it was Dr. Flavier's time or maybe Dr. Romualdez's time, but he wanted very badly to go to San Lazaro Hospital. Very, very bad. Because again, as I said, our speakers today are very good in clinical work, okay? And um, he's, he wanted to, you know, I said, what, what do you envision? He said, well, I, I want to be in San Lazaro, maybe be the director of San Lazaro. And I looked at Eric and I was listening to him. I said, you know, you're meant for much more, much more than that. Not that I'm belittling uh, Dodilian's position in San Lazaro, no, but I could see that that Eric had a passion for, for the public. He had flair in communication. And he was very good in epidemiology. So it's great to have Eric with us. He's um, frank, straight to the point. Speak his, speaks his mind, sometimes gets into trouble for doing that, but that's okay. We like that in this webinar. So Eric, uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, you're speaking here not director of GAMITS, but as an epidemiologist and as uh, a public health expert who is in a decision-making position and who's been through, who stayed in the department for a long time. Uh, you've been the respect of many of your colleagues. So welcome to the webinar, Eric, and go ahead with the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Susie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My greetings to Chancellor uh, Menchit, uh, to, to the Dean of the UP College of Medicine and other uh, affiliated uh, sciences in the UP system, to the Executive Vice President Ted Herbosa, to Dr. Tony Dance and to you, Susie, and of course, Raymond, and everyone who's watching this afternoon's uh, webinar. My virtual background is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is to remind me and everyone that the danger lurks. And this danger is something we can manage with what we have now, and we can manage better in the future. Let me share my screen. Is this screen on now? Thank yeah. you, Director Tayag. You can go okay. ahead. Okay. So, are the COVID-19 vaccines safe? Okay. Let's get the proper perspective. As of January 17, the World Health Organization reported over 93 million cases and two points, over 2.6 million deaths. In your screen, the countries are marked in terms of the cases reported in the last seven days per 100,000 population. The Philippines belong to those countries where in 10 to 50 cases were reported in the last seven days per 100,000 population. What's happening in our country? We have reported thus far, as of January 27, 518,407 cases and 10,481 have died. The case fatality rate is 2%. It is also the global case fatality rate. On the top of the screen, 
45% of cases per region are aged 20 to 39 years old. 70% of severe cases are aged 50 years old and above. And 62% who died are aged 60 years old and above. Below these two frames are the confirmed cases by date of onset and the confirmed deaths by date of illness. So what have we done so far? It was so simple. The messages were delivered to the public. It's ICT. It's our individual health measures. Please wear your mask when you're outside your homes and even at home when you need them. Observe physical distancing, avoid large crowds. Of course, the IATF would weigh the data that is submitted to them on a regular basis and make assessments on the level of community quarantines that may be imposed in any local government unit. The last one, so we have the I, C, and the T, the T3 strategy. While we teach people so that they can prevent and promote health during this pandemic, we should test, we should trace and identify those who may have been exposed and those who have illness so that they can be isolated and treated. Then the good news came. The COVID-19 vaccines are coming, especially when the FDA has granted emergency use authorization to Pfizer and just recently to AstraZeneca vaccine. Did you know, for example, that this on this screen, we have countries that have vaccinated most, many of their pop, population, and it's reflected in this screen. So the cumulative COVID-19 vaccination doses administered per 100 people as of January 27. Israel leads the pack with 49. If there were 100 people in Israel, half of them were already vaccinated, followed by the United Arab Emirates, Italy, and China. Over 70 million have already been vaccinated. But what else is in the news aside from the vaccination that is happening in many parts of the world. Did you get surprised that Myanmar has already started their vaccination ahead of the Philippines? Well, what else in the news? It has been lurking around these items that there are those who died after receiving a dose of the vaccine. Uh, and that uh, there are articles that say that uh, MRA vaccines have their risk and that the Pfizer and Moderna can be sued if anything, if anything that is harmful happens to those who receive the vaccines and that the specter of a new coronavirus variants uh, raises questions on the efficacy of these vaccines that have been deployed. Then we have a survey. Competing truths will always get unresolved. In this survey conducted between January 26 to 31, Pulse Asia cited reasons that influenced the respondent to distrust the vaccines. Overall, in the Philippines, 72% of the respondent uh, relay their distrust 
to the reports on Dynvaxia. And you can see the red box. Of course, uh, there is a 14 to 21% range wherein the information opinion from a public health care provider actually differs from other spokespersons or from other personalities that deliver the message. And so it was suggested that uh, limiting the negative news on that then Baksha and that the information and opinions from various government offices need to be aligned. So is vaccine safety a real concern? UNICEF in September 2020 showed that when we want a specific information that is most important for someone to know in order to decide whether or not to get a COVID vaccine, well, many cited side effects and the safety risk. Over on the right, what is the most important reason why you would not get a vaccine? Vaccine may not be safe. But are these safety issues also tied to trust issues? In the same survey, it is revealing that for the Philippines, the survey said, I do not trust the vaccines provided by the Department of Health. Although the overall trust is at 65%, one fourth of those who survey do not trust the vaccine provided by DOH. And what's telling about this is that in the national capital region, it's 47% who do not trust the vaccines provided by the Department of Health. But wait, are COVID-19 vaccines really safe? Let's run them down. One, the COVID-19 vaccine frontrunners rush the vaccine development. Many know that vaccine development can range from 10 to 20 years. And so having a vaccine and deployed even with an emergency use authorization in less than 12 months, exactly 10 months, for these front runners, everything has been rushed. But what people don't know is that the front runners, like the mRNA vaccines, that technology started since 20 years ago. And it has been perfected for almost a decade. And those who discovered and are implementing this new technology waited for an opportunity to use this. Rushed, it was something that they didn't recognize would be uh, advantageous to them. Who would have imagined that the pandemic was to an illness, a new illness that has high prevalence. And so therefore, when they conducted their clinical trials, they were able to see the impact or the efficacy of the vaccines because this increased the chances of exposures. And so therefore, they can measure it. So our mRNA vaccines, a technology that can alter our DNA, well, you have to look at your sources because it's a one-way street for mRNA. It doesn't become your DNA. And so we have to know our biology. People have died after getting vaccinated, as was reported in Norway, and it will be reported again. But is this something that uh, needs investigation? Of course. 
Is this something that we should be worried about? Of course, it's natural for us to worry about these reports. Anyone can be a skeptic, especially if these are reported in social media. Severe allergies have been reported after vaccination. In fact, anaphylaxis is a contraindication. Many worry about long-term safety effects. Yes, this was only an emergency use authorization. And we have all the regulatory authorities base their approvals with the uh, EUA on uh, trials that uh, are in the interim of phase three, and it's only after two months, but uh, there is a independent safety monitoring board that helped them make this decision. Good in paper until you get punched in the face. So that's all saying, oh, press release lang yan, don't, don't believe them. We should look for evidence that really it's bad. Yes, a vaccine is not from China or Russia. Remember the juicy, um, juicy perspective, okay? And it played out, and it can even have impact on our choices for these vaccines. Oh, it's not been tested enough for diverse groups of people. True. Oh, our healthcare professionals also express doubts of getting vaccinated. Is that true? Okay. The SAGE, the WHO experts, the advisory group of experts. If you read them for either the Pfizer vaccine or Moderna vaccine, this is what they have to say. Okay, older persons and persons with comorbidities can be vaccinated. For persons above 85 years old, we have to weigh if their current health status, especially if we anticipate that their life expectancy within the next three months is not so good. Lactating matters only for those if they belong to the priority groups. Persons with autoimmune disease, persons with history of Bell's palsy, persons with previous SARS-CoV-2 infection, okay, can be given the vaccines. And for those with previous SARS-CoV-2 infection, you can delay it up to six months. Uh, you can wait on queue. And so, therefore, uh, if the supplies are scarce, we can give them to persons who have not had SARS-CoV-2 infection. You can give them to persons living with HIV if they belong to the priority groups. But what is not allowed? Persons who receive vaccines other than COVID-19 should have a waiting period of 14 days. Persons who had anaphylaxis due to vaccine components is a contraindication. Pregnant women were waiting for new recommendations is the risk versus benefit. In fact, there are those who recognize that if you're a healthcare worker and there's pregnancy, then you weigh the risk against the benefit. Persons below 18 years for Moderna and less than 16 years for Pfizer, it's no. Uh, they didn't include them in the clinical trials, but now we understand that they are enrolling uh, volunteers in this age group. Persons with current acute SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, don't get a vaccine. Uh, please take your rest. Please make sure you're strong enough. Persons who previously received antibody therapy, there should be a waiting period of three months. Persons living with uh, 
HIV uh, if you do not belong to the specific group that was prioritized. And persons with previous SARS-CoV-2 infection know if there are scarce supplies. So let's go. Is it true that healthcare workers don't want to be vaccinated? In a recent survey of those we asked this question, 1,245, 67% of doctors said yes. 6.8% said no. The total number of doctors in the survey was 689. And listen to this, 26% are not sure. Okay. But what is most telling here is that Midwives numbering nine, okay, almost half of them said no, okay. And this is the survey results for that particular question. So when we ask them, how safe do you think? How concerned are you? Okay. They are concerned, but they think it is safe. The vaccines are safe. That's their perspective, those included in this survey. So let us seek first to understand, then to be understood. Let's not fight the anti-vaxxers. Let's not fight those who doubt. It's normal, natural to be skeptic. Like uh, Dr. Tony Dunn said, I want more data. I want results from the HDAC. I want them to finish the phase three clinical trials. I want pharmac pharmacovigilance. So for everyone's understanding, the emergency use authorization means it will take time to vaccinate the eligible population. The first jabs will be for the most vulnerable individuals or areas. So it's the healthcare workers because you save lives. We don't want you to be heroes and risk yourselves. We want you to be heroes that actually save lives and continue to save lives. The eligible individuals get to be enrolled, screened, master listed prior to vaccination. That's my office. Okay, I hope you have been included in the master list because healthcare workers are priorities, followed by senior citizens, the indigents, the uniformed personnel, and this will be followed by essential workers. So promoting vaccine confidence, health education, and counseling are part of the vaccination process. But wait, you can also be part of this endeavor, especially after listening or watching this broadcast. The management and treatment of anaphylaxis are available. We are ready for it. It's part of our logistics and vaccine management. The surveillance of adverse events following immunization is routine and pharmacovigilance is something that FDA should deliver. So where are we? We test, we trace, we treat. Let's include another T to make it a T4. Take the vaccine, please. Atin ang labanan ang COVID-19 sa bakuna tagumpay ay atin. And let me end this presentation. Vaccines do not save lives. Vaccination saves lives. Maraming salamat po. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you very much. That was Eric Taya, who is the Director of KMITS, Knowledge Management Information Technology at the Department of Health, but also an epidemiologist and a public health expert. And uh, truly, the perceptions around vaccines contribute a lot to people's behavior. So beyond the science that Tony has talked about, there's also what are people thinking? What, how can we help them understand 
and what information is useful for them, including healthcare workers. And we're going to discuss this a little bit more. So let me turn you over to Raymond for our, um, our next uh, speaker. Thank you, Director Tayag, uh, for that informational uh, presentation. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Susie. Um, but at, the, at this point, we will be moving on to the reactions. And we only have really one, one reactor for today's panel. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anna Ong Lim, who is a well-known pediatric infectious disease specialist. But more importantly, in our fight against COVID-19, she has been serving as one of the of health technical advisory group on COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Anna has a brief slide presentation. Uh, Dr. Anna, can you please go ahead with your presentation. Okay, so Damon, I'm not able to bring my slides up, but in any case, um, thank you for the opportunity you know, to um, be able to give a reaction to the two excellent presentations. Um, I'd like to start by uh, stating my disclosures. I'm a principal investigator of um, pediatric clinical trials in vaccines as well as in antibiotics. So that should show you that I do have a bias towards uh, favoring vaccines. And I'd like to say publicly that I'm a vaccination advocate. So once again, that does show my bias. But I hope despite that disclosure, you'll be willing to keep an open mind as I give my reactions to these two talks. Um, Dr. Dance actually um, gave an excellent presentation on the process. And, um, you know, when we were starting our work on... Um, understanding the whole vaccine procurement process, all of us in HPAC, because I am also with that team, um, were really quite confused about uh, how the process was going to be to be run. And um, we have to admit, or I have to admit that that confusion was um, very crucial in my um, skepticism about the program. And um, I think by showing or walking us through the process, by showing us the various steps and the various um, groups that are involved in assessing the vaccines every step of the way, Dr. Dance showed us that um, understanding the process, understanding the scientific rigor within which each of the groups uh, evaluate the vaccines that will eventually make it into the program, and understanding the built-in safeguards play a role in um, our decision or our um, effort to make um, or to trust this particular um, system. And the trust that is built is going to be critical to the development of vaccine confidence and acceptance among the public. Um, although he did end with a, uh, I'd like to see more data um, statement. I think this is really just prudent, uh, being a prudent consumer, you know, because all of us will eventually be vaccinated. And I think um, with or without the scientific training that we've gone through as uh, healthcare professionals, uh, magandang maging makilatis at masusing consumer. And I think you no, know, by saying that, um, uh, you can't be choosy or you just accept whatever it is that comes in actually is, um, how should I put this? Um, maybe saying or, or I can't find the word. Underestimating you know, the public and underestimating their capacity to understand uh, these issues and um, concerns even if we say that these are fairly technical, it becomes our responsibility as science communicators to be able to share the information in a way that uh, allows people to make these decisions in an informed manner. Now, going to Dr. Tayag's um, presentation, he, re he focused first on sharing with us the data that public opinion surveys will show that vaccine uptake will be pretty low, unfortunately. 
And if I remember the number, it's less than 50%, which is really very concerning. And uh, shared with us um, multiple news headlines and social media posts that seem to be driving this poor public opinion, while at the same time debunking some of the myths. No? And uh, I know as um, um, individuals, we, we've been bombarded by so many different um, headlines just today you know we heard about uh, this headline coming from germany saying that uh, astrazeneca would not be given to individuals in the elderly population and i i have to say that's actually clickbait because if you read the study and you read the decision that's not what it says um there are nuances to that particular headline that actually you need to understand to be able to appreciate why the decision was made in that way you know but having said that on a daily basis, we're really bombarded with all of these headlines and social media posts. And even for us as healthcare professionals, it may be a little difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff, meaning something sounds a little scientific. It's not part of our specialty. Our bias is, okay, maybe this is true because it sounds correct. But when you delve into it and do a deep dive um, and think about the science, it doesn't make sense no, and it doesn't connect. So... Um, this challenge is really, um, again, being posed to us as, as healthcare professionals to be able to translate um, this information um, for ourselves first so that we can understand it better and share it to the public in a way that they can understand and in a truthful manner. So um, having um, uh, picked those points up from the two presentations, I'd just like to now go on to something that I noticed in these two talks it's that um, they did actually talk about vaccine safety per se, despite the fact that our webinar is entitled, Are the COVID-19 Vaccines Safe? They actually talked about three important things, vaccine confidence, vaccine acceptance, and vaccine trust. And I think um, these are the really critical issues to answer for our public now. Um, we've been battered. Our vaccination system has really been battered by the controversies that it has undergone in the past. As a pediatrician who has to vaccinate children on a daily basis, I'd like to share that for the longest time, my dialogue with parents has always been, uh, mami kailangan po ng anak ninyo ng ganitong bakuna, eto po yung matatanggap, eto po yung gagawin ng bakuna, may mararamdaman po, maaring magkalagnat. And there has not been many questions. The usual response has been, Sige, Dok, kung sa tingin nyo kailangan, okay lang po yan. Now, three years ago, four years ago, we know what happened. No, There was this very huge uh, controversy about vaccines. And at that point in time, the landscape really changed. That even in my tiny private practice, I would get queries about, Dok, safe ba yan? I even had this one patient, a walk-in um, pair, no, a mother and a nine-year-old child, I think. And the mother was so distraught. Uh, this parent was referred to me by another subspecialist, a neurologist, because the child needed a Japanese encephalitis vaccine because she had some neurologic disorder, which required us to provide protection for all other um, neurologic infections. And so the child had already received his, her first dose and required a subsequent dose to complete the series. Now, in the meantime, the vaccine controversy erupted. Of course, they were seeing everything on the news day in and day out. And the mother was saying the child refused to be vaccinated because she thought she would die. And so it took a lot of effort to really communicate with the parent and the child to reassure them that this was not going to be the case, that the reports on media were vastly exaggerated, and that this vaccine would benefit her. But this scenario played out in a private clinic with a clinician who had the time and the information to be able to relay this um, knowledge no, and communicate this to the family. But we're talking now about 100 million Filipinos who might not have that opportunity and all they're going by is the headlines in the news and a lot of social media posts. So safety has actually been converted to an issue of do we trust the government agencies? Are we confident in industry? And can we accept these vaccines? Now, I leave that up for discussion because it's a really huge topic and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions in our chat box. But maybe as an additional talking point, I'd just like to share, 
this phrase, no? that um, coincidence does not necessarily equate with causality. A lot of events that happen after vaccination don't necessarily have to do or are directly related to the vaccine itself. Now, I mentioned at the start that I'm actually a, a pediatric clinical vaccine trialist. And one of the things that we usually um, are wary about is when we start our trials over the summer season. Alam kasi natin that uh, during the summer, a lot of our kids, so pre-pandemic, a lot of our kids are at home. And medyo mataas ang incidence ng dog bites during that time of the year. Now, um, kung nagsisimula kami ng trial during that summer season, pagka nagkakaroon ng dog bite, inire-report yan, of course, as a severe adverse event. And if you have enough of that coming into play, it's entirely possible that the product literature for that particular vaccine will say dog bite is an adverse reaction. And that's ridiculous, right? Why would you even think that a vaccine can lead to dog bites? So that's an example of um, coincidence not necessarily indicating causality. But even for these ridiculous events, what if it happened that globally they actually saw that administration of this particular vaccine predisposed to dog bites and there was a causal relationship then, of course, because we had a system that safeguarded consumers and was monitoring all of this, then we would be able to pick it up and then really say that poison dalilang, we should not be using this vaccine because it really does cause dog bites. Okay, so my point is this. For, a, for vaccines, there's a lot of times where events that happen after vaccination are attributed to the vaccine when in fact they are not causally related. But because we need to monitor just on the off chance that these rare events are actually related, then having a system that takes care of that, that monitors this closely, will be able to contribute to vaccine trust and confidence because it assures that vaccines are safe while um, uh, because they're undergoing constant monitoring. So I'd like to end my presentation with that and um, turn the event back to the MCs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anna. Uh, we have been having a whole lot of discussion and reactions po, no? in the chat box, uh, but maybe we could start the ball rolling with our first question. Dr. Susie, did you have an initial question for our panelists? Yeah, well, uh, before, we... that, before that, Raymond, what I wanted to do was to, well, of course, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for, uh, what should I say, a very um, on-the-ground kind of reaction. No? What, what do the clinicians see? Um, I'd like to start by looking at our um, audience poll so that our speakers know what our audience is thinking. So can we take a look at that, the first one? Can we, PVUP, can you help us? The, the other poll. Marami tayong poll today, no? So we're, we're, uh -huh. we're all right. So it okay. looks like we have half of our participants come out of Metro Manila, Central Luzon 12%, Northern Luzon 7%, Southern Luzon 15%, East Visayas 4%, 6% West, and we will do Central Visayas next time. Sorry, we forgot that. North Mindanao 3%, Central Mindanao, 1% uh, West Mindanao, and we should have put also uh, Southern Mindanao. Okay, so half from Metro Manila, half from the rest of the country. Most of the people watching, 38% are doctors, 29% are nurses, and we have a sprinkling, well, a number of pharmacists, 44 of the whole group, uh, a lot of public health people, and a lot of educators. We always have people from DepEd who are on the webinar. All right, now, would you consent to vaccination if it was free? 86% are saying yes, 14% are saying no. Would you pay for own vaccination? 65% said yes, 35% said no. What would convince you that a COVID-19 vaccine is safe? 49% said because of someone they know who has received it. And remember, Filipinos, have uh, relatives all over the world. So knowing that, so 49%, no? Um, my doctor says so, and I think this is what Anna was talking about, the power of the face-to-face -face communication between the health worker and 
uh, Anna, you've got 3,000 people listening to this webinar who can multiply the message. No? Um, LGU provides for free, very small, 25% at the DOH, and then friends would invite 7%. If you were to refuse an offer of a free COVID-19 vaccine, what would be the reason? 46% are talking about the brand and the country where it comes from. So that's giving us an indication around perceptions. Um, you are not convinced it's safe, 44%. Okay, so safety is, is a big issue. We need more time. You want to wait, 30%. Believe the production of the vaccine was too fast, 14%. 17% believe that the procurement, what is this? Kulang yung statement natin, no? It's not, okay, it's not, probably not reliable. You don't trust free vaccines, 3%. You would rather choose the brand at the time of vaccination, 38%. So uh, that's the audience uh, for our uh, for our um, speakers. And I think we're going to try something different for our, before we start the Q&A uh, and the questions coming from the audience, uh, Raymond. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, any one of the panelists to ask a question to any one of the panelists. So take it away. Whoever wants to fire a question for the group. Hello. Okay, go, Eric. This is for our group. That's for Tony, Anna, and me. Yes, for you. Yeah. Ask for, yourself. For me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Tony, what happens if there's no HTAC recommendation? Well, I, and the I, vaccines will have to be deployed and used. Yeah. And the I, HTAC has no recommendation yet. So what happens? That's going to be uh, a legal bind because it's mandated by law. So I think we need to figure that out now. We should have figured it out last year, actually. And uh, so mm -hmm. if, if they don't make a recommendation because they can't make a recommendation, parang nakakaiyak yun. Uh, I guess DOH or there needs to be an executive order mandating that they can uh, make a recommendation, uh, even based on an EUA without a certificate of uh, product registration. Yeah, so, uh, but we're hoping that doesn't happen, Eric, that uh, that the law will be, we're lobbying for that quick law. It's just one page, allowing them to make a recommendation based on um, EUA uh, without the need for a CPR. And they are making the evaluation already. Hindi na natutulog mga yan eh. So... Yeah, and uh, we're helping with some of the data and the evaluations. So, yeah, I think the main problem will be, will their recommendation matter? Because if there's no law at the moment allowing them to give that, then uh, we really, I'm not sure what will happen. Can, can I ask Eric? No. Yes, of course. Oh. It for that. <laughs> Can I ask you the same question? Because I don't know the answer. Uh, okay. okay. This is an emergency use uh, authorization. Yeah, yeah. There may be uh, legal complications regarding this. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have to weigh science and policy, Tony. Yeah. Uh, we have over 500,000 cases. There's the variant strain. There's 10,000 who died. The economy has to open. We are all reeling from the, uh, the uh, short and long-term effects of the pandemic. Okay, We should uh, weigh our decisions based on science. We balance it with policy. The policy is that not everyone will get their vaccines. If you think that even with the promises and commitments, the advanced market uh, commitment of the Philippines with the COVAX facility, it's not going to happen this year, okay? Who will get vaccinated will be the healthcare workers. 
And this is the purpose of the webinar, to educate you, give you the information that if you doubt the healthcare workers, and it is the healthcare workers that people trust that will tell them that these vaccines are safe so they can line up and be vaccinated to the bakuna centers na maaprubahan ng DOH in the priority areas, then, Houston, we have a problem. Isipin nyo, nagmamakaawa ang Pilipinas. Naunahan pa tayo ng Myanmar. Gumagawa ng para ng ating Pangulo, si Secretary Galvez. Okay, ginigisa na nga sa Congress at uh, Senado si Secretary Galvez at ang team ng DOH. Pero ang hindi nyo alam, gumagawa kami ng paraan. Yung araw ginagawang gabi, yung gabi ginagawang araw. Para maka, mabigyan tayo ng bakuna, mahirap makipag-usap po. At pag dumating, baka umabot ng 40% yung ayaw magbakuna, magpabakuna. Ay, anong gagawin natin dun sa mga bakuna? Tandaan nyo, may mga maseselang bakuna, kailangan maibigay kagad. O so yung iba naman, gusto talaga, ayaw, ayaw ko ng China, ayaw ko ng Russia, pwede ba yung Pfizer at Astra na lang. Sa real world, it doesn't work that way. Kasi po, kung ano yung maibibigay sa atin, ang haba po ng pila, sa United Arab Emirates nga, nagkakaubusan. Pero tingnan mo, kaya nakita nyo naman, ang pangalawa sila sa Israel, sa may marami nang nabakunaan per hundred. At problema rin tayo dito. May mga balita nga, may mga nauna na nagpabakuna sa atin, eh, mga illegal na bakuna. Kailangan mahuli yan ng FDA. Tapos alam nyo, didiskarte pa yung mga Pilipino. So kahit na sinabi namin ito mauna, naku, tinitiyak namin sa inyo pagdating ng bakuna, yung hindi dapat mauna, mauna pa. Ako na, iniisip ko na na mahuli ako eh. So thank you, Tony. Uh, Anna wants to something. Anna, can, I, can I just pick up on that? Um, kasi I, I do understand that um, a positive recommendation needs to be um, given by HTAC. So, so you used a lot of time, sir, in, in discussing the process. And um, ako personally, I have to say, nung naintindihan ko yung proseso, medyo kumalmakalma yung loob ko. Kasi alam ko ang daming tumingin yan na alam naman nila yung tinitingnan nila. And uh, after looking, after six or seven panels looking at that, siguro naman, um, pwede ko nang pagkatiwalaan yung decision nila. So, yung tanong kasi doon is, um, given that there's a critical point at which uh, an approval needs to come out, and ngayon pa lang na-identify na natin siya as uh, a particular, um, how would you put this, roadblock, hindi ba dapat um, that there should already be efforts to address this in the same way that actually FDA looked at a process change that allowed them to issue EUAs kasi na-anticipate na nila ito last year over something else and awa na lang talaga ng Diyos nandun na yung groundwork kaya nung pumutok tong COVID mabilis na nilang napakilo so in the same way we're identifying this issue with HTAC dapat siguro i-recognize na siya at gawa na siya ng paraan Yes yeah. I think Ang magandang balita rito Ana yung sinabi ni ni Tony behind the scenes nagumpisa ng magtrabaho yung ating age stack. So baka may resulta na sila dyan, malay mo. Tapos ang iniintay na lang nila yung legal imprimatur na sana madaliin, napakinggan yung mga rekomendasyon at uh, ma mailabas na kagan. Actually, there's a move in the Senate if I'm not mistaken. Tama po ba, Dr. Tony? Yes. Uh, Na-recognize siya eh, actually. Senator Pia Cayetano is the principal yeah of the bill which will allow uh, HTAC to come up with a provisional recommendation based on the EUA. Yeah. yeah. I'm optimistic about the results. Maganda yung ano, Eric, yung poll kanina, 85% will get it. So, kailangan anuhin natin, magamit natin yung momentum na yan. I think the other 15% will just wait for HTAC's final recommendation. It's a Papayag na sila. Oh, Naku, nakakaingganyo naman yan. Uh, magandang balita yan. Kasi 
kanino pa ba magtitiwala yung mga ordinaryong tao kundi magtatanong kay Doc? Mm-hmm. Di ba? Ano ba Doc? Papabakuna ba o hindi? Eh kung tayo mismo nagdududa, eh may hirapan po talaga tayo. Yeah, you know, I think um, this is very important that uh, the health sector, the doctors, the nurses, those who are going to receive the vaccine are well aware. And as Anna said, I agree with you, Anna. Like, let's not underestimate the public. I think people know. Actually, there's lots of noise and disinformation there. But I trust the public. I think the public can discern. And I think if we continue to talk about this and that face-to-face, that face-to-face discussion is very, very important. Kakalangan lahat ng barangay health worker, lahat ng midwife, lahat ng nurse. Everyone should know what the talking points are in relation to the importance of vaccination as we progress. Now, in the beginning, you're going to have just the health workers and older people, but later on, we want to vaccinate many more people uh, beyond those two groups. Okay, so uh, Raymond, let's go to your upvoted question. So 90 questions in the Q&A, and um, I'm okay. going to encourage Tony and Eric and Anna to please try to answer some of them because, uh, you know, you can do a brief answer, but I think there's really a hunger for information out there. And we hope that, you know, the short time that we're together, you can give your, your thoughts to our audience. So Raymond, go ahead. What's the upvoted, what are the upvoted questions? Actually, this is, my, this is probably our most upvoted question ever in the history of the webinar series. Uh, it has to do with um, ang priority po kasi, di ba, medical frontliners. Uh, the question comes from Joseph Thornton, who is one of our regulars, really. Um, the question was, uh, will the immediate household members of medical frontliners be included? I think that's an information that isn't really that definitively stated po, eh, uh, in maybe in official statements. Uh, can someone from our panel uh, give a comment? Or, Director Taya, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, ang nasabi na at uh, sinusubaybayan ng publiko ay ang nasabi ng ating presidente na yung pamilya ng uniform personnel ay maisama. Kaya naintindihan namin, eh, bakit uniform personnel lang at bakit yung hindi yung healthcare workers? Uh, yung pagpili po ng priorities ay based sa rekomendasyon ng WHO at sa isang framework kung saan dapat mauna yung mga healthcare workers kasi ayaw na natin silang malagay pa sa anumang panganib sa pagkatambako ng ito can save their lives. At uh, kailangan silang manatili dyan. Eh sino pang titingin kung sila ay wala na? Pangalawa, yung mga senior citizen natin, matatanda na po at nag-share ako ng data, hindi po sabi-sabi yan. Doon sa mga namatay, 62% are 60 and above. Ano pa ba data ang kailangang i-share natin? Ang linaw-linaw po. Pangatlo, kung yung pamilyang yun po ay mahirap, eh, hindi naman natin sasabihin baka masama pa yung pamilya ng healthcare worker. So samantalang hindi po nasasama po yun, eh nandam po yung ibang measures na pwede natin gawin. Magsuot ng mask, uh, social distancing, yan po ay uh, avoiding large crowds. Huwag kayong mag-alala sapagkat ang gusto talaga natin ay FDA approval kung saan natapos na nila yung phase 3 trials. So magkakaroon ng bakuna. Subalit, pinapaspasan din natin, gumagawa tayo ng paraan, lalo na kung maganda naman yung monitoring dito sa EUA, maganda yung bakuna, eh bakit hindi? Kaya lang, sabi nga ni Ana at ni Tony, nasaan yung age stack? At sana matapos na nila yan. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, that was a very good a very good explanation. I'd like to call in uh, Ted Robosa, who yes, yes. Our... <laughs> joined the panel. And also, uh, Dean Charlotte Chong from the UP College of Medicine is also here. So that we can, uh, we're, well, we're close to the top of the hour, but I think we can still have a bit of a, a discussion. And I have a 
question for for all of you. So let's include. Uh, Tushi, can I add to the discussion, Muna? Can I okay, ask sure, a question? Sure. Because a question was asked about HTAC. So my question is, and we're not familiar with this HTAC because we never had this. When I was USEC, we never had an HTAC. So my question is, is the HTAC a reg regulatory or a recommendatory body? That's my question. Because if it's recommendatory, then the Secretary of Health decides. If the FDA gives an EUA, the DOH Secretary can do it. Right, he, if he wants to do and deliver the vaccines already with FDA approval of EUA, but if you say each stack is a regulatory body, even if the the Secretary of Health wants to give it, he cannot give it. So that question, that legal question, has to be answered: Is each stack recommendatory to the Secretary of Health, or is it a is, is it a regulate regulatory body? Yeah. So. Can I answer that? Yeah. yeah, so according to, to RA11223, the wording is that HTAC can give a positive recommendation on drugs that PhilHealth or the Department of Health can purchase. No? But that positive recommendation is required. Uh, so in other words, if they give, a, say, there these 10 vaccines are okay, uh, then the DOH will decide Okay, of these 10, I think uh, the most feasible are the, these three. So in a, the wording is recommendatory, but because of the provisions that follow that statement, they do have a regulatory function uh, because procurement can only be made based on a positive recommendation. So that's, that's vague. That's how these lawyers want to put it. They want it vague. So my next question is, has the h -tap done its work to give a recommendation for Pfizer and for Astra because FDA has done mm -hmm. their job. Mm -hmm. So what the, I, I, think, I think there are two steps we're missing. We are delaying the whole process. I'm, I'm an emergency guy. To me, time is gold. And if you, if you don't do it fast, you will kill many people. So that to me is important. Even if you say it's regulatory, why couldn't they evaluate together at the same time? Why can't they sit down on one table and talk? Why can't FDA, as they issue the EUA, is already coordinating and submitting the same documents that the corporation submits to HTAC? And HTAC is already making with their heads and banging their heads. And, about, and when they come out with an EUA, there is an HTAC positive or negative recommendation. Yeah, yeah I think that's a very good. They're actually doing it, uh, Ted, HTAC and FDA. But I haven't heard a positive recommendation from HTAC for the two EUA issued vaccines. So my expectation is, dapat meron na rin. Pag naglaba ng EUA, dapat Ted, this is a... Ted, this is Doc Eric. Okay. So the HTAC is an independent advisory. So Tony and I have shared information. They already have started their work for uh, Pfizer and now uh, AstraZeneca. They don't want to preempt because there are some uh, legal complications. And I'm sure if they're finished with this, it's just there. And maybe they already shared it to those who will make decisions. And so therefore, this can be part of our uh, promotion to the Congress and Senate so that they can pass the required law on this thank you to, thank you ted uh, yeah, I, I, I asked this question from the point of view of emergency because i feel we deceived the president on this one we asked the press we, when we were negotiating for vaccines for pre-order we couldn't pre-order we told the president because we have no authority it is not in our fda so the president issues in december december one i think the authority to fda to issue an eua uh, if the problems are put forth to the president and the leader of the land, he, we would be able to put out solutions. We shouldn't put the solution after we're already there at the, at the edge of the cliff. Kasi nga, dapat ang solution na po foresee ng mga tao, especially in an emergency. Okay, Raymond wants to say something. Raymond, go ahead. Okay, so uh, if you go to hta.gov.ph, you will see the members of HTAC. And for uh, since uh, 
uh, may ninong, Dr. Tony Dan says that we have to declare. I'm declaring that I'm a member of HTAC po kasi. So part of it means <laughs> that we have done the work in regard as to the as to the time opo as to the timing po with regards to dapat po sabay sana ang pag-evaluate ng mga near near na na mabigyan ng EUA like ako niya po si AstraZeneca yesterday was given that is a, that's exactly uh, what we had in terms of an alignment meeting with all of the independent vaccine bodies that we had together with the Secretary of Health and the vaccine czar uh, alam niyo na kasi makasama kami noon Uh, so yun po with uh, the national adverse event uh, group, uh, the night tag, all of the all of the groups that was in the slide of the, the Dr. Dance uh, was uh, we have already that had that alignment, sir. But the uh, very very important point, EVP Ted, is to have that immediate on the timing with regards to transparency of the documentation that needs to be evaluated, so that we are not, uh, I mean, in terms of public perception, it doesn't seem like uh, there is a delay or dilly-dallying that happened so that we work uh, immediate in terms of having an EUA and we hit the ground running when it, uh, it arrives. Yeah, thank you, Raymond. Um, Dean Charlotte Chong. Charlotte, are you there? Did yeah, you want yeah. To yeah, so see. Go ahead. Yeah, did you want to say something, Charlotte? Well, actually, I've been listening. It's very heartening that we now have um, we now have increased values of uh, doctors uh, believing in uh, these vaccines and uh, would be willing to be vaccinated because initially, the the figures were very low, no, even among healthcare workers. I think this uh, webinar series is actually going to increase pa the number of um, uh, that it will lessen the uh, vaccine hesitancy among healthcare workers. But I believe that uh, there could still be improvements in the timing. I, I agree with Dr. Ted that uh, okay lang ng mas maraming tao working together at a more expeditious speed, uh, no, expeditious way. I think that's very important because our the public's really clamoring for the vaccines already, you know, and our economy uh, needs that boost already. So if we are able to give the authorization and have the vaccines uh, as early as possible. It will be a great help to the Filipino people. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte's the uh, Charlotte Chong is the dean of the UP College of, of Medicine. Um, you know, we're approaching the top of the hour, and so Raymond, um, can we go through our uh, evaluation, and then I'll have uh, we're going to ask our panelists for their parting words for the audience. Although some people are already saying we need a part two. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Dr. Susie, before I go into that, uh, sorry, if there's there's really one question that uh, is very pertinent, po, no? and it has to do with those who are post-COVID, and do they need or kailangan po ba na mabakunahan sila, or wag na silang mabakunahan, mabakuna, or anything of the sort. Maybe we can have uh, Dr. Dance or Dr. Ong Lim to comment on that po before we go into the... Okay, yung stage recommendations for Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, if you had past infection, you can be vaccinated. But they also mentioned if there are scarce supplies of vaccine. And because uh, antibodies have uh, been documented for those who had COVID for at least nine months, you can delay it. Sayang naman yung antibodies mo. But nobody is saying that you cannot get vaccinated. Ang exception lang are those who are acutely uh, infected with the SARS-CoV-2. But uh, hindi nila sinabi kung ano yung interval na the earliest that can they take the vaccine. Of course, that's the information we have from WHO Sage that can change anytime. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else wants to add to that uh, to that to that answer? Okay. So we're gonna do a round of um, what should I say? Parting messages for the audience, and we certainly will consider a part two. Uh, I <laughs> the chat box is overflowing with part two, please. So we will definitely uh, consider that and see how we can get that we can get that organized. Uh, but I'd like to ask everyone to give their parting words to our to our audience. We'll start with uh, Anna Ong Lim. Um, thank you, Ma'am Susie. 
Um, I think from my end, uh, what I'm seeing in this discussion really is that um, over and above the issue of safety, we're really dealing with a bigger issue, which is trust and vaccine confidence. And uh, when we recognize that these are the main concerns that people have, um, because we're able to identify the problem more accurately, then we're halfway towards the solution. Um, there was a comment in the chat box that said, um, healthcare workers need to have a more cerebral discussion with their patients about this topic. I'd like to beg to disagree because it's not just information that's going to solve the problem. There's a lot of trust building that needs to be done. And I think one of the more constructive ways that we can move uh, towards this during this time where we don't have the vaccines yet is to really take advantage of this time identify those elements that are causing people to have doubts in the system, in vaccines, um, and address those questions. If it needs to be an informational uh, campaign, then so be it. If it needs to be uh, an exercise of showing that people can be confident that the system is not going to be gamed or bypassed, then so be it. But as long as um, what we need to do really is to identify um, these issues more precisely so we can have a more focused solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, Eric. Okay. Ang paghahanda po ng Department of Health, katubang po ang mga local government unit, ay based on the assumption na pag dumating ang bakuna ay mahaba po yung pila at hindi po lalangawin ang mga bakuna centers. Subalit, sa aming uh, pag-aadala, sapagkat yung mga survey ay medyo uh, may malaking numero na ay magpabakuna, Maaaring ding mangyari na langawin yung mga bakuna centers. Mas maganda po na magtulungan tayo para mahaba po yung pila sapagkat ito ang bakuna is our way out para tayo magkaroon ng new normal. Hindi pwede yung pagkakasakit natin ang basihan ng herd immunity. Itong bakuna ay makakatulong po. At dyan ay hinihintay rin natin yung mga resulta wala po nagsasabing magiging successful tayo. Malay natin baka tayo ay pumalpak. Subalit ayaw po ng pamalaan at ng ating lahat, napapalpak tayo. So bilang Pilipino, kailangan mag-isip po tayo, huwag tayong basta magbibigay ng salita na sa tingin natin ay hindi naman pala tayong dapat magsabi nun. At kung may opinion po tayo, i-check po natin yan, baka yan ay makasama. Tandaan nyo po, sa pagbabakunang ito, hindi lang yung sarili natin nililigtas, yung nasa mga mahal natin sa buhay. So, kung para sa inyo po lahat, mag-isip po tayo, magtulungan po tayo, sapagkat iisa lang layunin natin, iligtas natin ang ating bansa. Tama na. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric Tayeg. Tony, go ahead. Um... Well, yeah, my, my, my message to everyone is that uh, it's important to protect vaccine trust uh, and confidence. But I think we, we have to look at it in a different way. We can't just protect it by talking about it. You know? We need to earn that trust. And people will believe us and we earn that trust uh, through vigilance. We need to be vigilant about the science. We need to be vigilant about the process. We need to be vigilant uh, and protect the institutions that are, you know, there's so much, uh, so many people working hard in government. But we need to protect them so they can do their work. Shucks. Uh, appeal to our leaders. Uh, to, you know, let's tone down the noise to our businessmen. Uh, let's, let's listen to the people who have been assigned by law to protect that process of earning vaccine trust. No? Let's leave accreditation. Let's talk. I mean, I mean yung accreditation, uh, ano yan eh? yung health technology, tatlong process yan eh? Health technology regulation. It has to come first. 
and then health technology assessment follows mm -hmm. after that and then health technology management which is you know with doh and the uh, lgus follows they they come one after the other and we need to protect those processes and be vigilant because that's how we earn trust hindi pwedeng sabihin lang natin you know uh, we need to show them that yes we are looking up king after these people and making sure they're heard and helping them so that their voices can ar arise above the noise no? so uh I, I mean we all have some contribution uh, to that noise i think and that's why i'm hesitant to say uh today na we should uh, use this one or that one and this one safer than that one you know wala naman kami tayong sinasabing ganun ngayon di ba let's wait for the verdict it's it's there we're waiting for the legal mandate so that htac can do its work uh in the future we should put them up there where they belong as the group that will protect us and help us choose they will represent the people they diba pinakita ko sa process kasama yung talking to the people they will help the people choose they will guide the people so let's wait for what they're going to say thank you very much tony dance um ted your yes. parting your parting words Okay, parting words, uh, get vaccinated. <laughs> I think it's an emergency. Uh, I'm an emergency guy. So I triage. I use little information as possible to make a decision that is life or death. So if the vaccine comes, the FDA approves it, and you're online, get that vaccine. Okay. Simple lang. <laughs> okay, Raymond. Thank you to our panelists for those very simple, very direct, really uh, uh, excellent takeaway messages. Po, no? um, what we are showing right now in the polls are the results of our very first question number, uh, sorry, the second ano pala, uh, survey question, second set of survey questions. Number one, how do we know if a COVID 19 vaccine is safe? Um, the answer by 91% of respondents is all of the above, as, as being shown on. Number two, how can decision makers ensure safety of COVID-19 vaccines? Uh, ang answer po ng karamihan, again, 91% is all of the above. A drug, uh, all about safety and uh, efficacious, efficacy. Uh, so, medyo hati po, 54% uh, true, 47% false. And then number four, their answer to our question uh, and this is where we got 85%, uh, 85% uh, of the respondents uh, say that COVID-19 vaccines are safe. For. But before we go ahead to our closing remarks, uh, may we ask TVUP to flash on the screen our assessment questions to our panel experts, for our panel experts. There we go. Okay. So this... So for those who are attending po, no, for the very first time, this is something that we normally do after each uh, webinar. And we hope that a lot of you who are still on the webinar will key in your inputs po. Uh, the first one, I'll just read it off the list. The first one mentions uh, a demonst panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge of the topic. Panelists were well prepared and organized, number two. Number three, the panelists spoke clearly and audibly Number four, they use appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explaining. And number five, I learned new perspectives and knowledge from the panelists on managing various key COVID-19 health issues. So, tuloy-tuloy lang po ang pagsagot. Hindi pa po namin to i-close as I turn the floor over to Dr. Susie. We have our closing remarks from uh, Chancellor of UP Manila, uh, Dr. Carmen Sita Pandilla. And she, please take the floor. Yes, uh, so thank you. Thank you for, um, um, to everybody for staying on to the very end. Um, so here is a summary of the things that have been discussed. Dr. Ted Herbosa, Executive Vice President of the University of the Philippine System and, and National Advisor of IATF, has given us a short history of the webinar series he was with us from day one, and after the initial success of webinar number one, it has continued to the next uh, 38 weeks. Uh, Dr. Herbos aptly said, we do not know what we don't know. And thus, in this webinar series, 
we invite the real experts who understand what is happening. Um, we had the three, we had two speakers today. The first speaker was Dr. Tony Dance, uh, who, um, who actually started with a very interesting uh, interactive poll to a question wherein um, we were asked to participate in a possible decision making, wherein uh, the points raised were uh, if we had the following data, three month efficacy, the cost of uh, the two doses, uh, accessibility to all, the side effects, effectiveness against the UK variant and the duration of the protection. Of, uh, protection. And what is interesting is that as uh, Dr. Dance gave us the, the options, our decisions changed. And he told us we really only have information for the first two, the three month efficacy that has been published and the cost for two doses. So what is he saying? The decision, the choice is a very complicated decision. But you know, in the process, there is confusion. And um, what is important is that we do not lose trust on the vaccine. Um, actually, Dr. Dance gave us a, a very simplified uh, um, table. It's, it's a graph. No, it's not even a graph. It's, it's a picture of the process. And I, I urge you to go back and go back to the replay and take a look at the process of approval, wherein he shows that the process actually involves many groups the groups involved in research and development, the core agencies like FDA, DOH, the LGUs, the core processes, as well as the support groups. So actually all of us are actually part of the process. But he highlighted a few things. He said that, you know, FDA is in charge of safety and efficacy. Can it work? HTAC will tell us, will it work? effectiveness, efficacy, and conflicts of interest. But DOH is the responsibility of making sure that it is equitable. Um, Dr. Tans gave a long discussion on the, the work of HTAC, and I urge the audience to actually learn more on what HTAC is doing because they will actually, they are helping in the final decision. As, as uh, Dr. Dan said, we are waiting for a positive recommendation because they're looking at respons responsiveness to magnitude and severity, safety and efficacy, social impact, affordability, viability, uh, responsiveness to equity and household financial impact. So it's, it's, it's difficult to say that, you know, um, at the end of the day, we're looking for a decision. But now after the lecture of uh, Dr. Dance, we can see that it, it's a very complicated process. So um, he actually ended, ended his talk by saying, so the question now is, are the COVID-19 safe? And he has actually modified it. He said, are the COVID-19 vaccines safe enough as of January 29. And the, um, if I may just quote him, he said that the agencies are untainted, the processes are maintained, and their mandates protected from political, commercial, and self-interest. He said, it depends. So at the end of the day, we must, we must trust the process, we must trust FDA, trust the OH, and we have to be vigilant. Our second presenter is uh, uh, Dr. Eric Tayag from the Department of Health. He gave us an update on the cases. Worldwide, there are 93 million cases with 2.6 million deaths. In the Philippines, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the burden is 10 to 50 cases per 100,000 population. Um, Dr. Tayag um, has this very important slide, I think, that we must remember when he said that, first, we must save lives. And he said, remember ICT, number one, individual health measures, face mask, facial distancing. Number two is community quarantines. And number three is T3 strategy, test, trace, and treat. Now, what is interesting with the presentation of Dr. Tayag is that he gave us a series of, uh, um, uh, how would I say this, issues that bring confusion to the general public. And the general public actually includes us, the doctors and nurses and the midwives. He talked about the news items and the deaths, the allergies, you know, rushing the vaccine, opinions on the mRNA, not having tested so many. All of these are actually adding to the conclusion, to the, to the confusion. That isn't the part of, uh, the, of COVID-19. Uh, COVID but he said, we have another history that's actually affecting our, our, our trust. And that is actually the, our history with the Denpaksha. Um, the, the history, they've had a recent survey showing that only 67% of doctors want to be vaccinated and 57% of the nurses. And we have to work on this. And we're happy that in this, in this webinar, we have more uh, health practitioners who are actually interested. Um, 
I'd like to recommend that everybody take a look at the SAGE recommendations because they actually give us, they adequately explains who should be vaccinated, who should not, and I will not go through them. But just to make probably uh, just one point that he clarified at the end during the open forum that um, everybody should really be vaccinated. And if ever you've had the, 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 if you ever had COVID and you've got enough antibodies and maybe it can be postponed. So I urge you to please read up on, on the SAGE recommendations. Um, he actually ends his talk by telling us it's no longer strat, it's no longer T3, it's now T4. He said, test, trace, treat, and take the vaccine. But we do have a responsibility of making sure that uh, we promote the vac uh, we promote vaccination to our to our uh, to our people. So once again, he said, vaccines do not save lives; vaccination saves lives. Dr. Ang Lim is uh, Dr. Anna Ong Lim, a pediatric infectious disease expert, as well as a uh, clinical trial vaccine trialist, and one of the advisors for ITF. Gave his his uh, reactions to the, the two talks. He actually acknowledged the the process that was presented by Dr. Dabs. As he said, you know, listening to the process and walking the process uh, makes us feel a lot better that you know we you know, that this is being undertaken by government. And this is really very reassuring. And that the decision is based on scientific rigor up to built-in safeguards that's being brought on by government. Um, she moves on by saying that, you know, opinion polls really pose a challenge to us health professionals because a great majority of the people in the audience are health professionals because we must correct this wrong information. So um, the second point, the other point that Dr. An An Ong Lee mentioned is that we've got to clarify three things. Vaccine confidence is different from vaccine trust and vaccine safety. Now, um, since she is a clinical vaccine trialist, she did mention, a, she shared a, something about rare incidents. She said that coincidence does not equate to causality, but we have to monitor all rare events because it is a responsibility and it adds to vaccine confidence. So the challenge is really the speed of making a positive recommendation that has been expressed, also expressed by uh, Dr. Ted Herboza and our College of Medicine Dean, Charlotte Chong. As to their final words, um, I mean, these are words of, let me say wisdom that we must remember. From Dr. Anna, she said, over and above, over and above safety, we are dealing with trust and confidence. From Dr. Eric Tayag, government, government wants to succeed and be careful with opinions which may affect uh, the, the, the trust of people on vaccine. From the, Dr. Tony who said, protect vaccine trust and confidence. We, can, we have to earn the trust through vigilance about the science, the process, and the institutions. Listen to those assigned by law and government to talk. Let us wait, be vigilant. And as uh, Dr. Ted said, this is an emergency. So let's wait for the vaccine and be vaccinated. Back to you, to you Susie and, uh, and Raymond. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Chancellor Manchit Padilla of uh, University of Manila. And um, gosh, Okay, we'll do. We will do a. Uh, we will do a. Uh, oh, we wanted to show the poll results. All right, so we're just putting that up on the screen now, Raymond. So mainly, uh, strongly agree. Very, very, yes, but, very very consistent with our previous webinars, Doctor Susie. Uh, I mean, this is uh, not arguably, but this is definitely our highest and most uh, attended po na webinar. We almost. Uh, reach our 3,000 attendee capacity for today, so that was uh, really impressive. And we all we almost breached the 4,800 mark for our registrants. So we hope to be able to sustain the interest of our uh, regular attendees, regular na po, no? and participants uh, later on. Okay, uh, for our sneak peek uh, next week, Dr. Susie. Okay, thanks, Raymond. I think while I'm doing the sneak peek. Uh, can we put in the chat box uh, the link, the YouTube where they're gonna go on YouTube? Because people are asking how they can how they can view it, no? So Raymond, maybe we can put that in the chat box while we're we're saying goodbye. But 
Um, so many of you want the same group to <laughs> talk again. So we're going to talk offline on when we can get them together. They're all very, very busy, but uh, I think they're smiling. They're going to indulge us and have uh, another session at some point. But we are not leaving the topic of vaccines next week. And in fact, we have an equally compelling topic next week. We are going to talk about, or we're going to ask, try to answer the question, who should not be vaccinated? And we're going to have uh, Nina Burba, who is an uh, infectious disease specialist from the Philippine General Hospital, and Dr. Shelly De La Vega, who is the leading gerontologist in the country, who will talk about older persons, seniors. I'm sure you all have questions around this. You have parents, you have grandparents. Even if we have the vaccine, should they be vaccinated? You know, when do you not vaccinate a senior? So be with us next week. Uh, we're not leaving the vaccination topic and um, we will get this same group uh, together again. I actually really appreciated your having a uh, discussion on yourselves. That was very cool and very interesting. All right. So until next week, we'll see you again. Uh, together, let us stop COVID deaths. See you. Raymond, over to you. Thank you and really a huge thanks and we really appreciate that our experts took the time out to join us in this webinar to share their nuggets of wisdom. Ika nga po ni Chancellor Menchit. And thank you also Dr. Susie. It has been another rather successful po and probably our most successful webinar to date. So magkita-kita po tayo ulit next week, same time, same channel. Let us uh, work together, beat COVID-19 and stop COVID deaths. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento. We hope to see you again next week, Friday at 12 noon to 2 p.m. So please keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. The enemy remains unseen. I'll keep your hand in mine. Let's say a prayer one more time. I know you long for home, but I am here, you're not alone. I'll stay with you until the coast is clear. The others fame before my fears The others love before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? My God, how long will this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head Until my To realize it's fine to be afraid, just hold on to the word he gave. This time will come to pass, cause this salvation's made to last. He'll carry you to see the break of day. The others pain the from my fears. The others vows before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head work Until my head dies From my fears, the others laugh before my tears, but right behind the mask, I look into myself and ask, Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'll keep my word, you would is mine. The others pain before my fears. Pushing on the spine of tears Please take us through another day Just hold my hand